or to the second day of the Federal Research Conference of General Sir John Sutherland Defense University. We are set to begin the second technical session of defense and strategic studies on the theme of conceptualizing security. We shall begin the session now. And to introduce the chairperson, I would like to invite Brigadier R.G. Vajpacher, the Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies. interests or nuclear security concerns in the United States. 
He is currently reading for his PhD, so which is shortly soon uh, at the University of Colombo's Department of International Relations. And he's working on nuclear complexities in South Asia. Great interest to all of us here. He is an alumnus of uh, uh, United States National Defense University, Washington, D.C., and Daniel K. Inouye, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies and East West Center at Mongolia Combat. Mr. De Silva has published research on strategic and nuclear safety culture in South Asia, and most recently co-authored the book titled Warfare in Sri Lanka, Military History of the Island of Earliest Times of the Independence. And if I may add a personal note here, uh, Mr. Sanat De Silva is uh, across him during uh, my tenure when he has elected him and his other colleagues at the BCIS. So, 10 minutes to you. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senior Professor Amal Jawadana, Madam Rukka, Senior Military Officers and Distinguished Guests and Friends. I'm so happy to talk about this topic, especially uh, in front of uh, a personality like Mr. Gupta because I know that he is very much in this, you know, business, business in the sense he, he knows a lot about it and uh, his feedback would be immensely uh, useful for my future studies. And this study was done uh, as a result of uh, research uh, that I have done, uh, especially a literature review that I have done for my PhD study. And then when I was going through my literature, I found out uh, the global nuclear safety regime, uh, which is the mechanism that is being conceptualized by the International Atomic Energy Agency, has not included the neighboring non-nuclear states specifically to the regime. So my, my argument that I'm going to establish in my 10 minutes is that it is very important to have non-nuclear neighbors in the regime and that can cooperate and that can give back to the regime immensely if you properly conceptualize it uh, in this regard. And from yesterday we were talking about uh, professional excellence through collaboration and uh, multiple stakeholdership and uh, caring and sharing kind of attitude. So it, it goes with this type of uh, setting as well. So let me start with, uh, let me start with uh, explain the, the context. This map that you see is actually uh, depicting the uh, nuclear power plants. Today I am not going to talk about weapons, but first I would say that weapons and power plants, both uh, I mean civil nuclear energy realm and the strategic nuclear realm are reinforcing each other, they are helping each other. That is not a secret, everybody knows about it. But today, my specific target is to point out the dangers that is not being discussed in the in the forums about the the dangers that can emanate from uh, the nuclear power plants. And you can see the the blue dots. I mean, this is very recently done uh, map, and this shows how these power plants have been uh, constructed by the countries. And there are so many. My point that I'm going to make here is that there are so many other countries without this uh, nuclear or strategic ambition. So they, uh, the point is that they also get if something happens, if a disaster happens, if a nuclear theft or sabotage happens, take place, all these countries are getting the effect because the threat is transnational. 
So the incidents are occurring frequently. If you take uh, you know the number of incidents, there is a scale called uh, International Nuclear Event Scale, and that scale shows that I mean, these are some of the events that uh, you can see in certain parts of the world, and anything above the scale number five, with wider consequences, or even four, is a, a serious incident or an event. So we know that there are uh, three nuclear disasters happen, major disasters happen with related to nuclear power plants, and also there are certain other incidents taking place like uh, radiological equipments being released to the public, and there I would like to uh, bring to your notice uh, this the recent accident, uh, Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011, and it is a very complex scenario. Everybody might say that uh, Fukushima accident is a uh, result of a tsunami and an earthquake, but I would rather say tsunami took place, there are other nuclear power plants also affected, but no damage, Fukushima damage because of the human error. So the report that was published in 2015 says it was really uh, the human mistake, the human error that caused the, the damage. And also, you can see that it contaminated the, 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 the considerable portion of the Pacific, and that is transnational. Japan cannot handle it alone. So my point is, when you have these transnational effects, you should have the collaboration of your neighbors to mitigate them. And I, I'll tell you why the neighbors are important later. And also the point is the accident anywhere can be an accident everywhere. So that, that's the that's the danger of this. And also the dangerous part can come from the nuclear terrorist side, and also a state can be a part of it, because if you take the history of nuclear explosions, nuclear weapons usage, United States is the only country which used a nuclear weapons against a civilian target. So it is no matter whether it's state or non-state actor, the danger can come. So therefore, uh, we have to be prepared, and people who have this Power. People who have this knowledge, people who have this technology knows how to do that. But what about us? And these are the two incidents that I want to highlight with regard to my argument. One is actually taken place in Brazil. Uh, it's called Guarania Nuclear Incident in Brazil. And that nuclear, particular nuclear incident uh, took about four lives. And it, in the event scale, it is uh, about four. And also in 2010, uh, in uh, Mayapuri district in New Delhi, both incidents, you don't believe that it happened because of the negligence of humans. It's not power, power plants per se, but the selling of old metal to the scrap metal dealers, you know, old kind of used uh, machines, which has some high radioactive to the scrap metal dealer, has exposed it to the uh, uh, general public, and some people killed, even in Indian case, one got killed. And this can happen even, not even in nuclear states, even in Sri Lanka. There were instances that we got radiological containers uh, to Sri Lanka and they were returned. So if we don't know how to handle these things, uh, you are in trouble basically. So my point that I'm going to make here repeatedly is please make us, you know, please bring us in the circle and acknowledge us what is going on and train us how to deal with them. So let's come to the main point. So this is the nuclear safety regime of uh, the present day IAEA uh, context. So you can see the central point is new, uh, national nuclear in the infrastructure of the state. And then you have another layer, and you have another layer with all the organizations, but you don't see neighboring states in this, because neighboring states are the most vulnerable. They are vulnerable because of two reasons, because of the transnational effect, and second thing is the prestige effect, or the status quo effect. If you have a nuclear neighbor who's threatening you, you are most likely to go for nuclear option. So non proliferation occurs at the neighborhood. And uh, 
I would I would make a point in your there is a concept called safety culture. So this is the theoretical underpinning of my argument. The safety culture is something uh, I mean consists of two values and behaviors result from a uh, collective commitment of state. So if the threat is common, if the threat if you are sharing the risk, why don't you share the responsibility as well? Why don't you acknowledge us about the responsibility as well? I don't know how many people, there are so many military officers here, I don't know how many people know here if there is a nuclear catastrophe taking place in the neighborhood, if you get the effect by the sea or by the wind, how many of you all know how to deal with it? And my remedy or, or, or my conceptual uh, creation, I should say, is to have some neighboring states as insular states. Or uh, Guzan says, you know, you can actually absorb and you can contain, you can actually work as a fence to a nuclear state by working with the nuclear state. And you are, you are taking the risk partially, you are acknowledged about the risk and you are doing R&D about the risk and you are working cooperatively about the risk where nuclear states all get the benefit and even the non-nuclear states get the benefit. And this is, a, this is not only a technical solution for them, but this is an adaptive solution for other weapons related strategic environment as well. You know that we have been subjected to what I call nuclear strategic jockey of great states. Because they are in a competition of uh, nuclear bargaining in this region, they try to use our resources to get benefit for their nuclear program. If you properly conceptualize your nuclear behavior and your safety culture, you will not be used by these states. I mean, there, it will be a reluctance to them, it will be a hindrance to them to use you as your, you know, as your, uh, as their uh, advantage. So that is a plus point on the strategic field. Finally, I should, uh, I should conclude uh, my presentation saying that it's, I mean, this is the title I picked from Michael Rapport's book, Better Safe Than Sorry. So therefore, we have to be prepared and we can't point fingers at the others when something happens. So include, by including neighboring states into the nuclear safety regime, we will be able to understand the radiological threats properly and uh, treat it uh, scientifically and appropriately. <laughs>
So with that reflection, today I'm going to speak about an analysis of the evolution of NATO from collective defense to collective security, and on this regard I'm going to use the theories of value preserve. So this is the overview of my presentation. I'm going to talk about a, a brief introduction about NATO and then its establishment and evolution, understanding collective defense and collective security, and then I'm going to move on to theories, the discussion, and finally the conclusion. Moving on to the introduction, the NATO was established as the guardian of international uh, security, but particularly in the North Atlantic region, and specifically to counter the threat of communism in the post-Cold War era, and also the possibility of another world war. Uh, there are, it was established in 1948, but today it has a membership of 29 members, although it started off with 12 members. There are 21 more uh, other countries which has entered into a collective uh, security kind of partnership with the NATO. And there are some other uh, aspiring members to NATO such as uh, Georgia and Montenegro. Uh, the important thing to remember is something which is also fascinating that 70% of the global collective military spending is, uh, that comes from the NATO because of its uh, superpowers uh, which are members of the NATO. This is a small map of uh, the NATO members, so you can see how vast uh, it has uh, the geographic expansion of NATO. Moving on to the evolution of NATO, it was uh, established after the Second World War. The idea came to the Benelux countries to start a military alliance, and they also wanted the, wanted the participation, of NATO, uh, participation of the USA because they thought it both necessary and important. Unfortunately, USA was not really, uh, not really interested in joining this alliance because it was more busy with the post-war reconstruction and providing economic aid. But the Berlin blockade, which happened in 1948, changed the stance of USA to finally join the alliance because it kind of uh, proved the imminent threat the communism is exerting in the world and in the West, in the, uh, West specifically. So finally, in 1949, USA joined the NATO, and uh, both this all these countries signed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which finally established the uh, North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, which is also called the NATO. The NATO has the agreement has 14 articles, out of which the fifth article serves as the backbone of the uh, of the military alliance. This is also essentially a transatlantic partnership because it kind of joins the, uh, joins the countries of the North Atlantic area. In the Cold War period, NATO was well, specifically uh, quite dormant without, uh, after all, it was a Cold there was no uh, direct military attack. Uh, moving on to the Article 5, which is the backbone of, uh, which I call the backbone of NATO. Uh, this is a quote I kind of, uh, summarize it, but uh, if you read it, you can see the parties of NATO agreed that an armed attack against one or more of them in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all. And if such armed attack occurs, each of them, in exercise of the right of individual or collective self-defense, will assist the party or parties being attacked, including <coughs> the use of armed force to restore and maintain the security of the North Atlantic era. This was uh, quite uh, not used because the only time it was used was the 9-11 attack and that was the first and the only time. So far it has not been uh, evoked elsewhere. This Article 5 acted as a force of deterrence because when there is such a mechanism, when most powerful countries of the world in this North Atlantic region are exerting a collective kind of threat, no, no country in the world would dare attack a member of NATO without the imminent threat of a retaliatory attack. This is a picture from the 1949 uh, NATO agreement. I'll quickly move on to my next slide. NATO in the post-Cold -war, post War times. Now, NATO was established to counter communism, as I told you, uh, told you earlier. But after the Cold War, what happened to NATO? After the Cold War, the, uh, the purpose of NATO demanded a redefinition because everybody asked, now what is the purpose of NATO when the communism is gone, when the Soviet Union has collapsed? And the uh, drop in 2000, 2000 calls, this change, a monolithic, massive, and potentially immediate threat has disappeared, which is the threat of communism. In 1991, a new strategic concept was introduced to NATO, which, uh, which laid down some other tasks or functions for the alliance. 
Uh, another important article in the uh, treaty is Article 6, which says the attacks on the territory. Uh, they only uh, this Article 5 only uh, is relevant to attacks on the territory, but they won't attack beyond the territory. But after Cold War, this article also uh, seemed to lose its meaning. Actually, another thing is security is indivisible. The, call, uh, the immediate tagline of NATO after its establishment, if you know, like uh, Lord is my famous quote, was that Americans in, Germans down, and Russians out. This tagline was to be replaced by security is indivisible, which was the post Cold War tagline of NATO, which, uh, which NATO understood that in the post Cold War era, security is indivisible. You can't limit security to um, uh, the Russians or the Germans or communism. It had to be redefined. Collective defense versus collective security. I told you that uh, NATO was established in. Uh, uh, on the premises of collective defense, which is basically uh, depending on Article 5. But what is collective security, which is relatively new concept? Collective defense is, uh, it draws its origins from Wilsonian understanding that potential security threat by an aggressor can be deterred by a coordinated global response. That is, if, uh, uh, if there's a coordinated global response when, uh, when an aggressor attacks one state, then there are some that acts as a force of deterrence, like Article 5. But Wilsonian understanding of this collective force is global in nature, but on the contrary, uh, when it comes to NATO, their collective defense is much less in scope because it's essentially regional. And collective defense is also reactive, which means it, uh, it, attack, uh, it makes a retaliatory attack only after an attack by an aggressor is made. But on the contrary, collective security is proactive. It identifies the potential security threats and tries to eliminate them at the outset instead of waiting for an aggressor to attack and then react afterwards. And collective security also includes both traditional and non-traditional security elements. And also, the, after 1991 and 1999 security, uh, sorry, strategic concept, new strategic concepts, there are three additional functions to NATO was introduced, such as WMB non-proliferation, supporting fuel crisis management operations, and to serve as a general toolbox for ad hoc security operations. Now, this uh, serving as a general toolbox is the main function of NATO today. It is beyond the traditional, uh, traditional conventional weaponry and security threats, but to serve as a general toolbox is, uh, I have given you some examples, such as uh, how, uh, Piracy operations in the Horn of Africa or capacity building in Iraq. They are not uh, essentially military activities, but they are non-traditional non-traditional elements, non-traditional security elements, because they are trying to curb, which are uh, trying to curb threats which are non-traditional, which are not really military in nature. This is a, a map of the current you know, security operations in NATO. Uh, the, map of, uh, the threats, if you can see the map, uh, most, most of the threats are beyond the North Atlantic region. It goes towards the east, which kind of uh, kind of proves that NATO's NATO should focus beyond the traditional uh, geographic limits. This is the most important part of my presentation. That is the theories on security. And for the for the purpose of this research, I'm only going to focus about variables and security. Busin's understanding of security is threefold. He understands, he kind of uh, describes security in levels, in sectors, and finally securitization, which kind of combines both. By levels, I'm going to uh, discuss about the regional security complex theory, and by sectors, there are five sectors of security according to Busin, such as political, military, economic, societal, and environmental. The importance of these sectors is that if you see these five sectors, uh, apart from military and political, economic, societal, and environmental are essentially non-traditional non security elements. But according to Busan, these non-traditional security elements can also grow into traditional uh, security threats. For example, if you take a natural disaster, which is an environmental security threat, it can go into a traditional security threat because of the scarcity of food, people are aggressive, and there's potential for violence. Regional security complex, which is uh, the level analysis. Regional security concept is an essentially regional theory. 
Uh, if I'm going to define to uh, define you the regional security context, it is a group of states whose uh, security concerns are clustered in the network and thus cannot be understood without amity and enmity with other states. That is to say, within uh, within a particular region, the countries uh, which are within this region, they have shared security threats. For an example, if you take the North Atlantic region in the Cold War era, the common or shared security threat was communism. Now it can be terrorism. Uh, and if you take the South Asian region, a threat, common security threat can be also terrorism. These are the three main premises of security complex theory. First is the impact of geographic proximity, which that is to say, uh, in the regional security complex, the geographic proximity is key, it is central. And the second is that security and interdependence is more within the complex than within and beyond the complex. And the third is that security interdependence is visually focused, but not to, uh, not to forget, it is also dependent on the power configuration of state, which is a very important thing in our further discussion. Now, if I'm to explain a bit further about this power configuration, let me take an example. If you take the South Asian region, uh, the countries in the South Asian region are very small, relatively small states, which are not very powerful. For them, security concerns are essentially confined within the region. They are not worried about piracy in the Horn of Africa. Uh, but if you take superpowers like USA or great powers like Germany, their security interests, their security threats span beyond their geographic limits. Uh, let me do a recap. This is about the strategy. Now we talked about 1999 strategy concept as well as 1991 concept, and there are five fundamental security tasks, and there are out of area missions as well as non Article 5 missions. Now, why a change of heart? Why did uh, NATO change its heart to, uh, like, so for example, the Article 6, which says they will not, they will not uh, go for missions beyond the territory? Why did they change their heart? Uh, that is because of the change in security dimensions in the 21st century, as well as the emergence of non-traditional security elements such as terrorism or piracy. And there are also new threats such as cyber war. Now, understanding NATO as a security complex. Yes, if you, I think you can remember the premises I told you, uh, told you before. So there are, there's a strong military cooperation uh, there are strong military, cooper uh, military cooperation among states within NATO and also there are strong military security interests as well as the interdependence within the complex is very much close. And uh, what about the third premise? That it depends on the power configuration. If you think of the three premises, you kind of think that uh, it contradicts the premises with the NATO current, uh, current operations, but it really does not. If you delve deep into the third premise, that it depends on the power configuration, which is to say that uh, small powers may not really get interested about the security threats beyond the region, but given the power configuration of uh, NATO countries, which are mostly considered great powers, their security uh, the security interests they, they span beyond the territory. So, out of area missions of NATO are justified by variance and security context area as well. In conclusion. In conclusion, NATO's inclination towards collective security complements Barry Russell's new conceptualization of security given the premises, given the guidelines of the uh, five sectors, including the three new environmental, economical, and societal uh, security threats, which kind of complements the NATO out of area missions in capacity building, etc. And also, it supports the regional security complex theory with the principle of great power interest transcending beyond the boundaries because they are superpowers and unlike the small states in South Asia or elsewhere in the world, their security uh, interests should span beyond the uh, their geographic proximities. And also, there are some more questions provided by yours. The first is whether there's a conflict between NATO's original purpose and the contemporary role. Uh, well, there is uh, some sort of conflict, but NATO should adapt. Second, to what extent have allies given new meaning to collective defense that is through collective security? Third is whether NATO has political uh, will and the technical capacities to tackle new challenges 
Well, they do not really because uh, given the economic constraints, they drain the uh, NATO's resources and there's declining public support. There are new threats such as cyber terrorism, cyber war, and also there's the rise of Asia and other alternative military alliances such as uh, the Collective Second Treaty Organization. Being smart for tomorrow. Now, collective defense is gone, collective security is also in the decline. Now there's a new concept called smart defense. Now everything in the world is smart from the phone to everything else. So why not NATO? NATO is going to adapt a smart defense approach in place of both collective defense and collective security. Smart defense is about harmonizing the resources and uh, being, uh, uh, adopting a cost-effective approach. There are three main principles of smart defense as prioritization, specialization, and cooperation. Uh, corporate, corporation. So NATO states would first prioritize their threats, uh, their, their security threats, and what are their missions. They won't just uh, handle, and, uh, handle every security threat in the world. Instead, they will identify the priority security threats and only tackle those. And they would also specialize. They specialize in national strength, uh, national strength. For example, if one member country has a huge military uh, military equipment or something, uh, for example, nuclear nuclear power, or, uh, nuclear power which can be used as a deterrent, they will use that threat. If some other country has an economic strength, they will put that strength into this pool. They will basically pool their resources. And cooperation, by which the countries, all the member countries, will cooperate to build each other's security or military capabilities. So that is basically about uh, about the NATO and the new threats it has, and also the smart defense. My focus was basically to introduce you the very recent security concepts and form some sort of a link between NATO, NATO current missions, and these very recent theories and also uh, to introduce you the smart defense concept, which is a relatively new concept, which, is, uh, which was introduced in 2012 in Chicago Summit, uh, but it's still taking time. They have, a, they have set a deadline for 2020. Uh, so I think you have got uh, a basic understanding of what uh, my topic today is. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you'll have questions in the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I thought NATO seems to be in the process with uh, President Trump asking to speech one to do one. So I do not know where uh, these theories are going to be developed. It is a relationship with NATO. Then of course this one the range has been mentioned in the Academy that has come up. And then the very good answer is the responses to the market that security was just in one place all the security uh organizations. And uh, there has been the talk about uh uh CS to the organization that uh led by the Russians. Yes. Yeah. 
is in the midst of a sizable portion of the global population agreeing that religion is private and should be kept separate from governance. However, if you look at individual countries, this um, demographics takes a hit. Uh, for example, a survey conducted by the Pew Research Center, the same guys who did this uh, study, after the uh, when they did a re uh, survey at, uh, in, in Egypt after the Tahrir Square Revolution, over 50% 50 of the respondents uh, commented that they want a significant role for Islam to be played in public matters and that religious parties can be a part of political fabric. Considering events of the recent past, religion has become publicly expressive and accepted, shedding centuries of effort to dethrone with faith as a source of political authority. Be it a resurgent Islam since the Iranian Revolution or a Hindu nationalist revival trying to forge the identity of India or ultra-Orthodox Jews uh, in Israel attempting to um, reshape Jewish identity or the Catholic Church using its influence to redesign the debate on a woman's right to choose and Buddhism once a religion of inward spirituality, now on a nationalist trend, becoming closely intertwined with the state and politics. Religion is and will continue to be a vital element in shaping war, peace, terrorism, democracy, authoritarianism, national identities, economic growth and development, uh, the rise and contraction of populations, and cultural values regarding sexuality, marriage, family, role of women, laws, nation, and regime, and the character of education. So, religion can be violent and repressive. But the last few decades have shown that religion can also be a destroyer of dictatorships, an architect of democracy, a facilitator of peace negotiations and reconciliation initiatives, and a warrior against disease and a defender of human rights. These many faces of religious policy, politics not only elude simple description, but reveal the broader reality that religion's political influence is extremely complex. The 1960s was instrumental in the descent of the secular movement. The 60s decade saw the decline and demise of the last champions of secular politics. In India, Nehru died in 1964, opening up space in the world's largest democracy for religious politics to raise its head. In Indonesia, the world's most populous Muslim majority country, the ousting of Sukarno from power in 1965 culminated in the gradual rise of religious politics. In Ghana, one of the main economic powerhouses in West Africa, the overthrowing of President uh, Kwame Nkuma paved the way for Ghana's churches to assert political influence. And in Egypt, the defeat of Nasser's armies by Israel in 1967 marked the beginning of the end of secular pan-Arabism and cleared the way for the creation of a transnational movement defined by religion to influence and dominate the political affairs of the broader Arab world. In every major religious tradition, leaders and movements have abandoned an exclusive focus on spirituality or cultural activity and have taken up political action as an integral component of their religious missions. The Muslim Brotherhood has dropped the apoliticism of its founder in favor of direct, direct political engagement. Hindu nationalist elements in India are organizing political parties and other political movements. The Catholic Church is promoting robust 
clerical and lay activism in defense of Christian values. And influential Buddhist monks um, in Sri Lanka have called for an end to inactivity on the part of the clergy and lay Buddhists and to have robust engagement with politics. The Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which brought about a long, purposeful and dramatic ascension of political secularism, has had to witness the unquestionable rise of religious influence in the 20th century, particularly branching off from Western Europe um, after World War II. The religion state arrangements have shifted away from integration towards various forms and degrees of institutional independence where religious actors enjoy some de facto or de jure freedom to act independently of state authorities or ideologies. Sometimes through conflict and struggle, sometimes through consent and constitutional change, religious actors have secured considerable autonomy and power. In conclusion, the institutional shift has been propelled by the attitudinal and theological changes where religious actors across major religions have abandoned passive obedience in exchange for involvement, mobilization, opposition and resistance. The secularization movement that seemed to be the front line of modern progress at the close of the 19th century today looks more like a declining and ideologically exhausted empire. Thank you for your attention. I uh, expect questions at the end of this. Thank you so much. I presented in the morning session. My question goes to Ms. Galaga, if I may. Thanks to your brilliant presentation, Madam. As you pointed out, that uh, the NATO is adopting or maybe uh, rather embracing a collective security methods, and you try to uh, you try to uh, par it with the Barry Buzan's uh, Barry Buzan's uh, the, the security theory. But if you look at the facts on the ground, I prefer to say that uh, there is a tendency. Uh, arising from the Balkan states such as Lithuania, Estonia or, and uh, Latvia. Those states happen to be the former uh, the satellite states of the, the Soviet Union. They have become, they, they recently have joined NATO. So don't you think that this sort of, this creates sort of a, a political and geographical unrest? Because all these states that I mentioned happen to be the member states of the Warsaw, which was the rival organization of NATO. I wish to know your opinion on that. Yes. Yes. Yes, please. I'm 
Okay. So we get back to Yes, like I find to say, like few days back, I was in Rome attending another conference where we had a collection of uh, other delegates from Romania, Estonia, the countries you mentioned. So there we had an interesting discussion with, uh, uh, about their willingness to join NATO. Their opinion was, I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question correctly, but pardon me. But I'm, what I'm trying to say is, there we had we discussed why they want to join NATO, but not to incline towards uh, towards Russia. Because uh, they, they kind of think that Russia is no longer their business now. They, they were under Russia for quite a long time, and now they are like literally fed up of it. Now they want to move forward. They, they precisely said that they want to join NATO, irrespective of any political, uh, political unrest or whatever. There could be a political unrest, of course, that if you take a, a Ukraine crisis, for example, there was a huge crisis. But at the end, uh, Russia had to give in. But Russia had to accept it because Russia is it, it is powerful yet. That is true, but still not as powerful as USA, and still it does not have the military capability of USA as well. So I think the Central uh, Central Asian countries as well, they are more inclined towards uh, USA, but not Russia. They do not want to go backwards. They don't want to be under the wing of Russia again. They want to move forward. So definitely. Uh, they would, they are hoping that they would gain the membership of NATO, but they would not join. Uh, they were quite kind of, uh, they were, they were quite sure that they would not join the CSO, the Security Secretary Organization, or anything regard, anything relevant to Russia. They really, really want to join the West and the NATO. They need that protection because Russia itself is, they kind of perceive it as a threat. So what they said was that we need NATO for our protection. That is their top concern. They need, don't need Russia again. There might be a political unrest because Russia, if you uh, talk about what Putin's Russian dream, he wants to build that empire again. He wants to go back to the time of USSR to have that regional, uh, that regional dimensions. But without the support of these uh, countries, I don't think uh, Russia will be able to uh, realize their dream as well. And these countries, the Central Asian countries, they also want to join NATO, uh, but not to go under Russian, Russian wings again. So I think I answered your question. Thank you. The second question was whether NATO, USA can survive without NATO, uh, which is an obvious no. But you were true when uh, Trump said that, the, that these other countries has to uh, contribute a certain percentage of the GDP to uh, NATO as well. I think it complements the theory of uh, smart defense. I, I hope I'm not contradic contradicting again. Because smart defense built on the, is built on the premise or the assumption that they all have to cooperate, not on the not, uh, USA contributing the most of it because it has the highest GDP or whatever, but all of them has to contribute because all of these countries face economic uh, recession uh, together. Like, they, they have equal uh, impact on them. So all of them have to co cooperate. All of them, them have to cooperate relatively, relative to their GDP. That is all about small defense, not just one country providing the most of it, but they are pooling their resources. But, but they, they, are, they are giving uh, to NATO the national power element they are most sure of, they are, they are most capable of. So I don't think USA cannot uh, can survive without NATO. So it has to uh, it has to be a part of NATO, and as well as other countries also have to uh, pull their resources in to do their contribution. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. I'm Dr. This is the question for Mr. Kalki. With your last answer, despite these all amendments to retain the uh, NATO organization, uh, first you take. Why is uh, the German Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel and recently the French President Macron was uh, thinking and expressing their view of uh, 
to have a security cooperation without the US? Well, without USA, because you see, like Germany, it's not a member of P5, but an aspiring member. I don't, uh, there, there is some sort of call rivalry between USA and Germany, because Germany is not granted the permanent membership of the U, uh, United Security Council, but they kind of deserve it. They may not be the superpower like USA, but still they are a great power, they still have that capability. So France and Germany, they, they kind of out of league of USA. USA tries to dominate, especially with the new, uh, new, uh, new principles of Trump and his uh, mechanisms. So there is some sort of animosity between these countries as well, although they are inside the inside one alliance. And not to forget, France once uh, actually quit from the NATO uh, during, uh, like, all, uh, during the Cold War times because France refused to be under the dominance of NATO and USA. So it can be a kind of a reflection, a mirror image of that past incident. These countries, they are all, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of power. They are all trying to uh, gain dominance in the alliance. They don't want to be under USA forever, especially when it comes to Germany. They want dominance, they want more power. They don't want to be the, the, fa the, the failure of the second world, but they don't want that mindset anymore because they have moved forward. So they, they might be trying to enter into a different partnership away from NATO, away from USA, away from USA's influence. So which, which, which is uh, kind of plausible because uh, even USA is in a downturn nowadays. Like it can't, uh, it, it can't continue like this forever. It won't be the superpower for the next two centuries. But these countries, they are uh, aspiring powers. They may gain the center stage in the future. So it's really important for them to cooperate now onwards to, uh, to get ready for that future stage. Yes. As far as I know, and 
in my belief because I'm Muslim. Right? Uh, there is no political uh, I mean, in in religion because religion is a, a directly relation from human to God to the Creator. So in in uh, Muslim or in Islam, uh, there is nothing to do between uh, our uh, belief and the world. So what is your opinion about it? Thank you very much. Thank you for your question about uh, Russia and China alliance versus NATO. Russia and China now they are part of the Collective Security Organization, which I I, I, thought, I, I said it but before that it's a very mysterious organization. I I quite made a response because I learned it kind of uh, very recently, kind of recently. So what my understanding is that now Asia is on the rise, as I said in my presentation. And every millennium there is a new power like. Before it was the UK and the European state, and then came the USA. Maybe, uh, as I believe, maybe it's a time for Asia now. It's it's Asia's opportunity now. So Asia is on the rise, increasingly on the rise, especially China. Even during the federal shutdown, it was China who came to USA's aid. USA, although they still maintain the superpower position, it's it's it, uh, its power is draining, increasingly draining. So it's important for Russia, which also has a superpower dream as against or in contrary to USA, it's important for Russia and China to work, both of them to cooperate uh, in terms of uh, developing a security alliance like NATO. For NATO at the moment, it may not be a huge challenge because it still has the power, but uh, NATO might take some actions such as uh, with other allies it has, for example, uh, South Korea, which is not a part of NATO, but under the security or the nuclear umbrella of NATO. So it's important for NATO to cooperate with its allies in the Asian region, especially uh, Pakistan or North, uh, South Korea, to maintain its power and impact in the region against uh, the rising power of Russia and uh, China. But CSO as well, it's increasing on the rise, so maybe at some point, at some point of the future, they will over, uh, they will transcend the power of NATO. Uh, first of all, to the question about uh, uh, I think the main thing that can be done is engagement, continuous engagement uh, with the religious community and the political establishment. Uh, thing is. When it comes to Lord Worlds, you, I mean, there's some element of self-radicalization that you can't stop. Given the technology, you can just go online, read some scripture or or teaching or a preaching by somebody and you can get self-radicalized. So, whether you can 100% eradicate that, given this day and age, it's impossible. So, from a more tangible perspective, I would say that engagement where the political establishment, the law enforcement, military, engaging with the local uh, religious establishment uh, and knowing what is happening, what are the grievances, the, the, the community feelings about what is going on, things like that will give an impression about where the community is heading, whether they are turning right radical, whether, whether they are um, you know, being radicalized by the institution itself or whether they are being self radicalized. So I think that kind of engagement in the overall sense is what we can do because religion is something that uh, is, is private so you can't really sort of bring regulations or something stop it. You can but then uh, uh, destroy the whole democratic fabric then. Uh, so I would say in terms of from a terrorism point of view, it's for engagement. And in terms of Islam, I would agree with you, yes, uh, religion is your direct link with your God, your creator. And when it comes to Islam, the, the line between political and theological is extremely blurred. More so than other religions. Uh, but 
what I mean by political division is that even though it is a personal matter or whether it's um, it's something where the lines are blurred between political and ideological, it becomes political when you try to sort of create a community that is monolithic. Like say if it's Islam, you try to create an entire community of of Muslims, then what happens to the non-Muslims? Then that becomes a political matter. So things like that. So with with, with uh, religious nationalism, that's that's a pretty, uh, political um, factor that needs to be considered. When it comes to uh, religious radicalism, that's something of a political matter that needs to be considered. So yes, I agree with you again. Religion is something very extremely personal. It's between with you and your God um, or whatever higher power, but when it affects other people who are not you as an individual, then it has a tendency to become. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the first point you said, first point you agree, the second point is the status quo point. The classic example is uh, Pakistan, because uh, the, the proliferation of nuclear weapons in Pakistan is totally a status quo business because uh, they, they wanted to have a, a kind of a counter threat uh, for Indian nuclearization, but Indian nuclearization is not uh, for, not to counter Pakistan, but uh, to counter the Chinese threat. So, so you can see the proliferation happens in the neighborhood uh, rather than uh, outside the neighborhood. If you take uh, the Middle East, uh, because we all know that Israel is a nuclear state, uh, uh, you know, the, it, it's a kind of a de facto nuclear state. Uh, the others also see, because uh, Saudi Arabia Recently, I saw a video on BBC uh, saying that Saudi Arabia has uh, asked Pakistan to keep the nuclear weapon ready to deliver if they, if they want to have it against any enemy. So Egypt uh, may have, you know, and Iran is a classic example. So therefore, status quo matters whenever you pose a threat to your neighbor. My argument was actually you can use your neighbor as a strength to, to work uh, collaboratively uh, to strengthen your nuclear regime uh, as long as you strengthen each other's uh, nuclear 
or rather the national security interests. So that's one. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, Mr. Silva's point is a very important point and a very larger point. And this fits in with the, the concept of non-traditional security. And I suppose we feel that states, different states should cooperate with each other. So none of the point might happen to be earthquakes or any other disasters like that. So, why not about uh, a possible disaster is the interest. And I think he made a point that uh, when such projects come up, there could be some discussions and some uh, taking on board the concerns of all concerned because the winds will not uh, distinguish between one country or one region or the other. So I think this uh, point is well taken. But there could be some practical uh, issues as to how do we actually, in this uh, age of uh, sovereignty, people are uh, you know, very conscious about their sovereignty, how should such a question come up? And this is the larger question of other countries. Uh, if students are friendly, I think there could be many ways of handling uh, this issue. Training capacity in everyone. Even the nuclear power plants that you set up, the energy that comes out of that, that can be appreciated. Uh, and that way you are sharing the benefits of it. It's not just the risk, it's also the benefits. Uh, so I think uh, we need to think through this and whether uh, IEA has done some work, whether there are any norms, there's still a lot of thinking that needs to be done, so in the ways that should be things. In terms of nuclear power, as you mentioned the Fukushima, we have been this, through this debate, you know, first reaction of the Japanese was to shut all the uh, nuclear power plants. And now slowly, so nuclear energy, because of its repetition uh, being as clean energy, and it is so important to produce it, is here to stay. And there are only like 70, 80 reactors which are right now under construction in various parts of the world. Even in Europe, we saw that uh, Germany uh, shut off its started buying nuclear energy from the neighboring country in France. Now, what kind of uh, shutting off the nuclear power? I think energy is important. Energy is uh, also a defining feature of our age. And uh, nuclear energy is uh, not going to go away. Uh, and of course, the concerns about nuclear energy, you know, but the safety uh, issues are also very important. And a lot of work has been done, and I think uh, the IE itself has done. And in this, uh, if there could be guidelines or norms, we will always be. Then we had a very interesting representation again about the NATO and also who is on the interesting comments. Again, here, yeah. uh, first work NATO. I think NATO is a And uh, it has been so since uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. Trying to make Russia an enemy. But look at Germany. 
today, Europe is consuming at least 25 percent. NATO itself began with a, you see, the debate during those days was firstly uh, why it should have been, should have been, and should have been reformulated itself. That didn't happen because there was pessimism. But the key question of history and key question of today is tomorrow remains what is the relationship, security relationship between Russia and Russia? This has been there for This question has not been resolved as yet. NATO was one strategy. But with bipolarism gone, and militarism also gone, and multipolarism coming up, and with regionalism coming up, what is the uh, result? It cannot just be a few countries of the Balkans, just because four or five countries in the Balkans think that there is a great uh, Russia threat, and hence uh, NATO is required. That cannot be. NATO is, as you, your map shows, it's a they have a partnership for peace programs in other countries as well. But this still doesn't answer the question why we did today. Where is that enemy? It was about that enemy. And today, the concept of security is changing. NATO remains relevant to them. That's the fundamental question that I think we should be asking. And that should be asked about other regional security organizations can also be asked about CST. So I think the definition, the clarity of uh, you know, objectives, that is what NATO is missing. And they have had many summits and every time they add and subtract a few things, etc. And in fact, except for uh, the researchers, nobody else remembers what is the NATO. But more important, there is now internal crisis. I remember a few years ago, I was at the Munich uh, Security Conference. And as you know, Munich Security Conference was set up way back in the 50s during the Cold War years to take on uh, the, uh, the Soviet bloc. And every year they hold it. And they said, I was in one meeting where all these NATO big uh, people were sitting there, etc. And they were complaining that NATO is almost losing its race and there is so much lack of coordination, not enough resources, and so much pressure on uh, the countries to share more resources. And Europe today has a, a very different kind of problem. The way, uh, let us say, the Europe sees, uh, the America sees this uh, security threat, and the way Europeans see, they are very different today. Today, for Europeans, it is the migrations. It is uh, the people who have come into Europe, that has become the, one of the biggest uh, threats. And the big countries like France, uh, Germany, and Italy, etc., Left to themselves, they'll find a mode of movement in with uh, uh, Russia. It's not very difficult for them to find a mode of movement in Europe. Just Deputy Prime Minister of Italy, I was uh, just hearing on the television just yesterday or day before on CNN. He said, we can meet with Russia, what is the problem? So I think there are uh, a lot of uh, problems there within the NATO. And now, if you see the whole uh, uh, security environment changing, supposing tomorrow, North Korea and South Korea, this. Uh, takes place. And if uh, the whole uh, environment is uh, uh, in, in Paris, so NATO is important, but I think first it has to sort out its own problems. And then there is also this another uh, animal called European Defense and Security, e, uh, what is called the EU DSP, Security and Defense. Uh, they also have a strategy. The European security strategy is very different from the and the question of sharing of assets always comes up. And the Turkey today, which is uh, a very big uh, country in NATO, is today at Logan, actually another uh, member country that is uh, uh, European, uh, where the uh, USA. So NATO is, uh, I think, going to evolve, and they're going to really think about the uh, process. And I think a very interesting uh, presentation on by Mr. Nikumar on uh, the certain religion and his sector. I think before we talk about uh, uh, religion, let us talk a little bit about the secular 
great model, separating the church and the state, etc. But it hasn't delivered. And uh, each secularization also became as militant as uh, uh, the religion. You see, so they were also forcing it by laws, by all kinds of uh, Essentially, what happens is when exclusive, when religions or any other becomes exclusive, they are not communist. So that's the first part, and that is why today the importance of uh, reaching out to the others, reaching out to others to understand uh, what we call sambar or dialogue. Um, some years ago, it's, uh, this uh, book, very famous book. Clash of Civilizations, the question of dialogue between civilizations that was in fact given by Iran, uh, taken up by the UN, number of seminars which have happened. Then dialogue with religions, it's very important to try to understand each other and not talk at all. And religions are by very nature, they have certain assumptions to which they have some assumptions. Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, Christianity, and so on. But if religions become close, and they don't allow others to ask questions about those assumptions, then I think we have a huge problem. But if that, uh, in the spirit of a dialogue, we begin to try and, under, and uh, uh, foster genuine understanding by actually going to fundamentals, now, of course, some religions, you know, you mentioned uh, several examples you mean of the like, and they are into politics and etc. <laughs> These are all interesting I think there is a core of religion. That is what we get where the first religion should be. And that is where the dialogue has to happen at that level. So that better understanding is uh, uh, fostered. But the role of religion in war and peace has been immense. You mentioned the uh, of Westphalia. Westphalia was really, what was it? It was really the religious wars which have been going on in Europe between the Catholics and the Protestants, and which uh, hundreds of thousands of people died because they held on to their assumptions. Because I, won't, I would not like you, uh, I don't like you because you have different assumptions. You don't like I, My assumptions uh, are very dear to me. So you had this bloodshed, and there was also, so it was in a way, a practical way, okay, and there were also principalities, the small, small princes, there were no small, small princes, each holding on to it, and it was also happening at the time of the decline of the uh, Pope and the authority at that point of time, the Catholics were declining. So you had this issue, a practical issue, and that's why you came together and said, all right, let's not interfere or intervene. Separate the two. But it really, in many times, it didn't happen, and that separation broke down time and again. And you know, that's a uh, history. Uh, so, politicization of religion is something which has been there uh, all this while. But the religion also offers uh, many solutions to some of these problems because, at the heart of every religion, there is the welfare of the person, there is also the connection between the God. Uh, the person, and there is also uh, uh, generally uh, there is morality and ethics, which is very important, which is quite common in most of these religions. Now we don't look at that and we look at the political aspect of it, and as a result, we have these uh, uh, problems. Now we also, I think. Uh, uh, in, when you talk about uh, uh, ethics and morality, you see, all the IR theory of uh, today and, you know, and Ruzan, uh, the product of that, it has, because maybe it has not confronted the question of ethics and morality. Uh, since it has not uh, and human beings are essentially they want to know what is right or wrong. Somebody tells them, okay, this is right because they are religious, so they adhere to that. But I think we have to bring in the question of 
And many of the issues of non-traditional security issues, you know, which are of those questions, are in And here, I can certainly talk about, uh, uh, you know, we are talking about the certain situation. We are talking about uh, how the central bank is shifting to Asia, which is also going to be the last challenge to the And ancient civilization. I think we need to take a certain civilizational approach, not necessarily but a civilizational approach in the community will come and try and see what is it that we can uh, curl out of that and use it to resolve those uh, conflicts, maybe foster respect for the uh, environment, uh, you know, universal environment. Now, all this looks very, uh, you know, idealistic. But it's idealistic because if you look at it from the theory of international and we are used to this question. Time has come for the Asian civilizations to start looking at themselves and not be defensive about uh, Asian values. Of course, confront your past. See that uh, if you have done something wrong, you have to put a finger on that. But look at those Asian values and see that whether there is some solution to that. Because then this is important. What has happened is that Western thinking, also partly because of colonial uh, mindsets that you know, through education, language, etc., have been imposed on us, has somewhere suppressed our own value. I think we need to be more original today. And we need to look at, uh, I'm talking about Asia, but part of the world, we must start looking at uh, our Asian uh, civilization and values. Uh, just to mention once again, I had briefly mentioned it yesterday, uh, in 2015, Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister Modi, uh, they launched a, a program called uh, Indo global There, the focus was on Hindu civilization and Hindu And at the core teaching, like the value of person, mercy, so on. And similarly, in uh, Hinduism, there is concept of divinity. The Western literature or Western thinking is that human beings can be bad. Comes from a certain religious thinking. Whereas in our thinking, human beings can see the divine. We can talk to the divine, nurture that divinity, and, and there is certain oneness. World is a family. Vasudev Kutubuka. World is a family. Now, these concepts I think need to be brought in, and the researchers like you, perhaps, uh, and the institutions like yours, should start looking at this and see whether these are relevant to uh, this. Because conflict is increasing, conflict is deepening, there's so much of bloodshed, and it is quite clear that thinking, particularly coming out of IRK, it will be all right for practical purposes. You can solve some problem, etc. But when it comes to deep issues of peace, war, etc., we think we have some limitations. Whereas we don't have that limitations here, because when you talk about the world as a fact, or when you talk about divinity, when you talk about mercy, karuna, etc., then I think uh, uh, we will have a very different view of security. And probably we will be pro approaching security first from our traditional security. Of course, the world is divided into states. There is the Westphalian uh, system, which is there, is not there. There has to be a concept of sovereignty, etc., and that is also very important. But remember, we are also living in a phase of transition. And the Australian world is only 500 years old, 1600, 1648. 1648 to 2048 is less than 400. So it's less than 400 years ago. And the visa system was introduced just about 60, 70 years ago. People were otherwise free to move. So it's not that we have not seen this uh, diffusion. So what we talk about globalization, 
So today when we talk about free trade areas, we want to remove all barriers in terms of duties, but we want to put all the barriers in terms of So I think there are some contradictions which we have to face, right? And that is where the Asian thinking, Asian values, Asian civilizations, Asian religions, they may have an, uh, something to invite to offer. And I'm not at all saying that we should be exclusivist, because that is not the Asian way. Asian way is sabko saath language. Take everyone, sabka saath, sabka vikarna, let everybody be together and let everybody develop. So I think uh, this uh, session has raised uh, uh, some work. And I want to add uh, one, uh, another point. That we always talk about, uh, you know, Barry Guzans and, uh, you know, there was also Rosevitz and uh, Machiavelli and all that. Have you forgotten? Did the thinking start only when the Renaissance in Europe took place? Or was there something? I think there are many people. There is a lot that is need to be said. And if you talk about stagecraft, etc., have you forgotten that 2000 and uh, what, almost 300 years ago, there was Kapila, there is Arthashastra. And today, the theory of uh, alliances, the so called the Mandala theory, I mean, which was there in Kapila's time, he talks about it. Then he, when he talked about uh, uh, foreign policy, we talked about the attributes of uh, foreign policy, which is called or six uh, attributes of uh, you know, foreign policy. And uh, then he, in the nature of statecraft, and also the fundamental point, Cordelia is not as has been caricatured in the West and some scheming. At the heart of that thinking of that time, Arthashastra, the thinking of that time, was the welfare of the uh, subject state. So that's where it starts happening. Of course, it's very enhanced that was a state class. And where did it all come from? But that thinking, Arthashastra, there were at least 20 Arthashastras before that. So the Arthashastra, which Cotillia writes in uh, th uh, third century BC, is only a culmination of a similar thinking on policy issues in state power, much before him, because in the opening chapters he mentions the name of at least thinking. And this thinking goes on much after Cotillia uh, 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 also, right up to the 16th uh, and 15th and 16th centuries. So there is a, and then you have the Chinese uh, state power. And I'm sure in many other countries it will be And I think it, we need to go back deep into that without being, uh, you know, uh, exclusivist. We have to start studying and our institutions, KDU, DCIS, and our institutions, and the others, is that in this part of the world, should really uh, rediscover that. The security, when you say conceptualization security, should not just be left to conceptualizing Western and Western concept of security has been which on which all our But look at in some sense So with that I want to uh, thank uh, our panelists and our audience for the wonderful interaction and the audience for the session and thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to the end of the technical session two, which explored an array of con conceptualizing security from different views. We are thankful to the presenters for sharing their knowledge with us, and to give away the certificates to the presenters of the session, I have done of inviting Major General Dato Abdul Rahim bin Hij Mahmud Yusuf.
H गा लगे ए वाई बिट में सही ना We are also grateful for the person participation of the chairperson, Dr. Aravind Gupta, and we shall now present the token of appreciation to the chairperson. And with that, we conclude this session and cordially invite you all for the lunch where VIP and VVIP guests will be served in the cafeteria and others will be served in the officer credit mess. After that, the third session of the day will be commenced at 13.50 hours at the same venue. Thank you very much. <coughs>